right around the time that John Rawls writes his theory of justice, the early 1970s, another very important thinker, Irving Kristol, puts out a piece titled Capitalism, Socialism, and Nihilism. In it, he is indirectly taking up the accounts of justice as proposed by people like John Rawls. He suggests that a new type of philosophy has taken over American public philosophy, that being the public philosophy of what he calls the new left. Here he suggests something very, very interesting. Uh, in, in many ways, the argument that has been forwarded by Marxists and communists in the 20th century has been discredited. But he wonders why capitalism has not been given credit. And the argument that he forwards is an argument that takes into account what's really transpired over 500 years in Western history. So there's some important categories that he's going to cover in this piece that I want you to be mindful of. Uh, as you do the reading. He says that if you turn back to the aristocratic Middle Ages, what you're going to find there is an old conservative um, ruling structure, what he calls the old right. That old right, made up of priests, made up of kings, made up of nobles, believes that it has a great view on how human beings should live and on how um, human beings can achieve uh, flourishing. They argue that the best way to achieve flourishing is to turn to older sources of wisdom, uh, to know the truths of the Bible, to know uh, the truths of nobility that come from hard study. Now, the old right faces a revolution as we move from feudal society to capitalist society. But the first revolutionaries were not revolutionaries of the left, but revolutionaries of the right. Here, the older liberals like John Locke and others revolutionized European society by suggesting that every individual knows what happiness is for themselves, that uh, no aristocratic structure ought to be telling them what to do, uh, that we know what our happiness is, that we want to labor and acquire happiness through production and consumption. So a lot of the 17th and 18th century liberal thinkers are what people um, would call the new right, or crystal terms the new right. But it's not until the 19th century that the left comes into being in Western society. And that left, what he'll call the old left, is led by Karl Marx, among others, suggesting what? That this revolution that took place that allowed individuals to be freed from aristocracy has not made them happier, but it's made them alienated. What Marx offers uh, as a member of the old left is he offers a new vision of society uh, each, uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, suggesting what? That economic fairness will allow human beings in total communion to be happy. Well, another revolution takes place in the 20th century. Even though Marxism doesn't work as an economic idea, a new set of leftist thinkers come forward, what Crystal terms the new left. And the new left doesn't care about thinking economically. It agrees with Marx that there should be a high floor for people, that everyone's material needs should be taken care of. But in terms of all other transcendent ideas, it believes that every individual ought to be free to choose what they want for themselves. So a total permissiveness, ideationally, and a total being taken care of in terms of one's material well-being. Now, why is this important uh, to Crystal, and why, why is he suggesting this as a conservative in the 1970s? Well, for one good reason. He doesn't believe that a libertarian right has the tools, has the power, to be able to confront this new left. Simply by advocating uh, an argument against central planning, simply by advocating free markets, the right is not going to be able to counter the new left. The right needs to have a more soulful understanding of the human experience, of what troubles the human condition. Only a right that takes into account the human soul will be able to counter this new left argument that has won over so many advocates.